Thank you, Mike, for that very kind introduction. Um, I am a member of the CNO executive panel, I was invited by Admiral Richardson, and uh, uh, one of the, the first thing I asked uh, the Admiral was, uh, are there any kind of special projects we could work on? And uh, he said, well, yeah, you know, you, you come to me, you, you tell me. And uh, I said, well, is there any, any project that's reviewing the Naval Academy's football program? Because I'd like to become <laughs> involved in any, anything that takes a look at that uh, so I could run up the road to West Point. Um, Janine, uh, Secretary Davidson, uh, whom I've known for many years, as she said, uh, very, very hard act to follow. Uh, I'm going to do my best, but uh, I have to tell you I was a bit discouraged uh, because I, when I found out that uh, Secretary uh, Davidson was speaking, I called up here to talk to Mike and uh, said, uh, well, what, what's the Secretary going to talk about? And so we, we talked a little bit about that, and I said, well, um, Last time uh, I spoke here, I, I didn't use slides, and he said, well, she's not using slides. I said, well, I, I won't use slides either. Uh, and then Mike said, uh, yeah, no, you better use slides. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I said, well, is she, she telling any jokes or anything, you warm up? And uh, he said, no, and I said, well, I, I won't tell any either. He said, yeah, no, you, you, better, you better bring some jokes with you. <laughs> so. Uh, I figured, well, I'm the CNO executive panel. Uh, they said if you ever need any help, you know, so I, I called up uh, Captain Morris and said, uh, you know, uh, anything in the CNO joke file? And he said, for you? And uh, I said, yeah. And he said, well, uh, you know, CNO's a, uh, a, a submariner. He's, he's, uh, he's a nuke. He's, you know, uh, he's, all he's got is joke file or physics jokes. So uh, I said, well, um, you know, give, give me some and I'll, I'll take them up. And he said, uh, okay, yeah, I, I guess we could use you as sort of the guinea pig. Uh, but I really am terrible at telling jokes. So when we get to the Q&A, if you want to hear the physics jokes, uh, then I, I will tell them, uh, especially if you have a hard question that might give me some difficulty. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm uh, actually the warm-up act uh, for the, the great speakers you're going to have here uh, today and tomorrow. And so what I thought I'd do is just give you uh, some impressions, some thoughts about strategy that, uh, you know, that might help you as you listen to uh, some of these other distinguished speakers. So let's see if this actually works. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about, this is sort of the, the roadmap, uh, a little bit about what is strategy, you know, why is strategy uh, difficult, uh, some characteristics of good strategy, and uh, some strategy sins, as I call them. And then finally, uh, talking about uh, the fact that, as, as Secretary Davidson said, the, you know, the threat chart is going like this, and the resource uh, chart is, is kind of going like that right now. Uh, what are some ways that we can sort of bridge that gap? And hopefully, as I said, that'll set you up for the, uh, for the good uh, presentations that follow. So, so what is strategy? Uh, Hope you can read this well enough. I, I put the uh, font as, as big as I could, but these are some distinguished strategists who basically uh, you know, give you the, the fundamental definition of strategy. You know, strategy is uh, you know, how you apply the means at hand uh, to achieve the, the ends that you seek. And you have uh, everybody from Richard Betts uh, all the way down to the official Defense Department definition that tells you that. Now, uh, that, that tells you something, but it doesn't tell you a lot. And uh, my colleague Barry Watts and I, but there are also Richard Rumelt, uh, who advises or advised people like uh, Steve Jobs on strategy, General Smith, uh, the, uh, the UK. Uh, they talk about strategy, uh, and they add something to it. And they say that at the core of strategy, really the core of strategy is about identifying, developing, and exploiting areas of advantage. And we might add to that by saying identifying those advantages that we have that are becoming wasting assets. And doing this all in a very dynamic environment where your adversaries are trying to do the same. And if you're a great power like the United States, you have multiple adversaries. So you're competing against a range of competitors, not just one or two. Uh, but again, I think, and I'm going to come back to this, uh, the core of strategy in my estimation is identifying, developing, and exploiting new sources of advantage. Why is strategy hard? Okay, Colin Gray uh, says it's, 
it's so difficult, it's remarkable that uh, we ever actually get strategy right. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty discouraging for somebody like me who tries to do strategy. Uh, the great Jimmy Dugan, you remember Jimmy Dugan? Uh, he was head of the uh, Rockford Peaches. Uh, Jimmy said, uh, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. And indeed, strategy is hard, uh, and for these reasons. The situation is dynamic. It's always changing. You know, you're trying to deal with something that's not static, but it's a moving train. Second, there's so many variables. Uh, Secretary Davidson just uh, mentioned a, a, a plateful, and we didn't even get into the, the economic and diplomatic aspects of, of strategy in any great detail. Uh, it's not a moonshot. Uh, your enemy is actively trying to frustrate you. You're not just trying to deal with overcoming physics that are well known to get to the moon. Uh, you're dealing with somebody who's trying to disrupt you in every which way from getting there uh, or from getting the, the outcome that you seek. Uh, another problem, you know, information. You know, the strategist who sits down and tries to plot out strategy, does that person have accurate information? Uh, the problem today seems to be we, we have so much information that we can't separate the wheat from the chaff but then there's still that information that's being kept from us. Or efforts that are made to actively misinform us about the true nature of things, intentions and capabilities. Why is strategy hard? Resources are limited. Uh, we, we know that, but as I'll explain to you in a little bit, sometimes we don't act as though, especially in a rich country like the United States, that resources are in fact limited. The competition is nonlinear. What that means is essentially that if you add 10% to the defense budget, it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be 10% more secure, 10% more effective. Uh, it's a very nonlinear kind of activity. And then finally, you have to convince your boss. And here, here are some comments. Uh, Sandy Berger in the 90s, Warren Christopher during that time period, Susan Rice more recently, skeptical about strategy. And I sometimes wonder if they were skeptical because they didn't believe in strategy or skeptical because at that time it seemed as though we were doing strategy so poorly uh, that they said, you know, why should I have a, a deep interest in, uh, in this product, if you will, uh, if it's not particularly good strategy? Why is strat you ha your boss has to convince his constituents. I was recently reading a biography of Eisenhower and Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House in the 1950s when Ike was president, Ike, of course, a Republican, Rayburn, a Democrat. And Ike says, I told Eisenhower, just send up your budget. I'll give you 95% of the Democrat votes in the House. You, can you imagine that happening today with President Obama and the Republican Congress? Of course, uh, it's hard to find somebody who invaded Europe and, uh, and won uh, our half of World War II. Uh, but the point is, uh, you have to convince, and I think Secretary Davidson made the point, you know, the, uh, the administration works with Congress. It doesn't get a free ride. It's not a private business where it can just chart its own course. And then finally, the strategy may not be executed as set forth. Uh, Peter Rodman wrote a book uh, some years ago sort of going through the, the national security history of the presidents during the Cold War. And he found that uh, it was extremely difficult at times for presidents to actually get the bureaucracy to do what they wanted them to do. Uh, Truman uh, once joked about Eisenhower, he said, poor old Ike, you know, he's used to working in the military, you give orders and, and they get carried out. He'll come up here, he's going to be president, and you know, poor Ike, God help him, uh, he's going to have to deal with the bureaucracy, the Congress, the media, and everything else. So again, the strategy, uh, just because you have a good strategy, the execution part shouldn't be neglected, shouldn't be ignored. In fact, you almost have to work that into the crafting of strategy if you want to have a good one, one that has a chance of being executed. Some characteristics of good strategy. Let's see. Uh, again, I, I, like, uh, I like Ike, okay? Uh, <laughs> West Point graduate, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, Ike's talking about you, in a way. He says, uh, you know, principles of strategy are really simple but it requires the hardest kind of work from the finest available staff officers. And if you just, if you absorb what, you know, some of the reasons why strategy is so hard, you'll understand why Eisenhower felt this way. The other thing he said was, plans are useless. I, you know, I th often thought about the QDR when I was reading this. Uh, <laughs> you like that, huh? Uh, planning, 
plan, by the way, Congress, I guess, in the current NDAA has abolished the, the QDR. So, you know, for those of you who are going to the salt mines or the Pentagon, you may, you may get some slack there. But uh, don't get your hopes up, okay? Uh, why did he say this? And again, it gets back to the point that you know, the situation you're dealing with is dynamic. You know, if you get that perfect plan done on uh, you know, June the 14th, 2016, the world, as Secretary Davidson said, is so dynamic, it's changing so quickly that, that the half-life of that plan, even if it were perfect, which we know it's not for all the reasons I gave you, uh, that plan is, is, you know, quickly becomes obsolete. How did Eisenhower deal with that? Well, one way he dealt with it, 171 meetings of his NSC uh, during his first administration alone. Part of that administration, he had a heart attack and he was uh, hospitalized and bedridden for, for a number of months. 171. And it was basically just the principals. There was no group of folks like you sitting along the wall to help out the principal. You imagine being locked in a room with Eisenhower and nobody, you know, no backup. And here's the guy, you know, D-Day and all this stuff. Uh, and he said, you have to be living with the problem. Those meetings were not designed to come up with a perfect strategy. It was just designed that, you know, when it hit the fan, you know, the emergency situation, that we would be less screwed up than the other guy. I mean, that, that's basically what he was hoping for. And uh, there's an interesting book, Eisenhower 1956, that talks about the Suez Crisis. And Eisenhower's point was, well, at least we have been thinking with and living with this problem. It's not something that came to us out of the blue. Yes, we're scrambling, but the other guys are scrambling even worse than we are. Andy Marshall and Richard Rumelt. I mentioned Rumelt in, uh, in the link with uh, Steve Jobs. He wrote a book a couple of years ago called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. He talks a lot about uh, his work with the Pentagon as well. Uh, Andy Marshall, uh, about two years ago, retired as head of the uh, Secretary of Defense's internal strategy think tank. But again, getting back to this issue of asymmetries and advantages, uh, they would argue that a good strategy, again, exploits those advantages. A better strategy aligns your advantages against your enemy's weaknesses. You know, think of a football game where you have a good running game and the other guy has a weak run defense, and so you're going to run the ball. An even better strategy aligns enduring advantages against enduring weaknesses. Okay, and a great example of that comes from the work done at institutions like this and the people who graduated from it, the maritime strategy of the 1980s. And the problem we had then, I don't know if you can see this all that well, but the problem was how could we reinforce Europe? We had a lot of forces there, but in the event of war, we were going to have to move a lot of stuff to Europe very quickly. And the question was, the Soviets were getting better and better with their submarines. And so how do we protect, again, in a sort of an advanced version of the Battle of the Atlantic that was waged in World War II? And so that was the goal. You know, how do we reinforce and sustain NATO? And how do we deal with this growing fleet that was going to threaten the slocks? And we said, well, what are our enduring advantages? And this was uh, in the really, to some extent, in the wake of the second offset strategy that I'll get to in a few minutes. We had very quiet submarines. So hard to, hard to detect our subs. We had very good sensors, easier to detect theirs. Uh, we had a geographic advantage. We had the, the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap where we could operate from that bottled up the Soviet fleet, again, making it difficult to get through those choke points without being detected. And the Soviets had weaknesses. They had loud submarines, where we had quiet submarines. Uh, their, their sensors weren't all that good. Uh, geography, again, I mentioned the, the choke points here, having to get through the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. And then fears about their boomers. Uh, they had long enough range missiles, but they were concerned that uh, their boomers, who were up here, uh, that they might be threatened by the fact that we had such good attack submarines. So the strategy was align our strengths against these weaknesses highlight the anti-submarine war threat to their boomers through forward operations up in here in peacetime. The results was the Soviets pulled back a lot of their better SSNs, a lot of their best SSNs, to protect their boomers. And again, it was uh, an effective way for us through the maritime strategy to achieve that objective, one that the Soviets could not, a problem posed to the Soviets that they could not find a way out of very easily because, again, enduring strengths on the part of the Navy, enduring weaknesses on the part of the, 
the Soviets. Okay, the quintessential strategy, again, enduring advantage, enduring weakness. Okay, here you go. Scissors cuts paper, all right? Remember that. <laughs> Scissors, paper. That's what I know about World War II. <laughs> okay, the third offset strategy. And again, remember uh, what Secretary Davidson said. You know, the emphasis on speed and new operational concepts. Okay, we have had three, according to uh, Deputy Secretary Work, who really has done a lot to lead the way on this issue. The first was in the early 1950s. And uh, we were faced with the fact that the, the Soviets had tested their nuclear weapon, that our nuclear monopoly was a wasting asset. They were building more and more. They were building delivery systems, long-range bombers, uh, ballistic missiles. And so this was an asset that was going the way. And Eisenhower basically said, look, uh, if this is a wasting asset, we need to have a new advantage. He ruled out preventive war against the Soviet Union as a way of resolving our, our situation with them. So you're in a long-term competition. With this guy, he's going to have nuclear weapons. Eisenhower said, in a long-term competition, what's going to count for a lot is a strong economic base and a an, strong technical industrial base. And he looked at Europe. And Europe, there was a Lisbon conference in 1952, and NATO committed to fielding 90 divisions. I mean, can you imagine that? 90 divisions. And besides sort of saying this is crazy, uh, you know, we're never going to be able to do this, Eisenhower said, let's ride this advantage, let's ride this monopoly as long as we can, and cut ourselves some slack to allow Europe to recover economically, industrially, technologically, their key allies, and you could argue secondarily the Japanese as well in the Pacific, uh, because this is a long-term competition. And if you're ruling out general war, and Eisenhower uh, thought that general war, once the Soviets had a sufficient number of nuclear weapons, would be a catastrophe. So you're in this long-term competition. So again, riding a wasting asset, a, a, a source of great competitive advantage that was uh, basically fading in order to create a new source of advantage. By the mid-1970s, the Soviets not only had an advantage, at least we perceived it, in conventional forces, they had caught up in nuclear forces. We had the SALT-1 and we were negotiating the SALT-2 agreement. So we needed to find a new source of advantage. And the industrial technical base that we had built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was about ready to give us that advantage. And it came in the form of IT, information technology. And I was a, uh, a young Army officer at the time, and I went to the, uh, the PX at Fort Bliss, and they were selling these things about this big. And uh, Texas Instruments, it was a pocket calculator. And I, I didn't, I, I looked at this thing like, oh, uh, and they said, no, this will do everything your slide rule will do. I said, there's nothing that will do everything my slide rule will do. <laughs> Does anybody here know what a slide rule is? <laughs> and uh, so, I bought this thing, went home, and my wife said, you spent $30 on this thing? And, and I said, yeah. And uh, I didn't tell her. I went back six months later, and they had a much better one for about $20. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter was, I wasn't buying one that was made in Kiev or you know, uh, Leningrad. I was buying one made in, in uh, wherever Texas Instruments makes their stuff. Uh, but the point is, this was the, the onset of an enduring source of competitive advantage we had over the Soviets, information technology, broadly applied, okay? Uh, you know, they, I was buying a Tandy computer, not a, you know, a Miko Yan computer or a, you know, MIG computer, but it applied in so many ways. It, in it applied in terms of quieting our submarines, improved sensors, uh, it, enabled at least a running start at the battle networks as part of the strategic defense initiative because that was really one of the hardest parts of you know, missile defense, the battle network. And all that was driven by information technology. And those battle, what we learned there really began to apply as we built the battle networks for precision warfare. Uh, precision weapons themselves. So all these things gave us an enormous advantage, uh, the kind of CAD CAM technology we need to do to design the stealth aircraft. Again, battle networks, quieting of submarines. And then we kind of go back in history. What's all this about down here? 
and uh, Secretary Davidson mentioned it to you. The third offset strategy is not going to be like either the 50s or the 70s. The third offset strategy is more like the 1920s and 1930s. There you had multiple great powers. You had, as Secretary Davidson mentioned, rapid advances in commercial technology. You know, the automotive industry, the aviation industry, radio, the onset of radar, and the recipe for success went to those militaries who could figure out how to use this stuff, how to integrate it into new operational concepts to give themselves a big boost in combat capability to deal with the problems that they were facing and to do it faster than the other guy could. And so that's really the core, I think, of the third offset strategy. And I think the Pentagon's got it exactly right. And it's, uh, in this case, I think it's hard to argue against history. History doesn't maybe repeat itself, but boy, there's a lot of strong themes here. OK, what, what are some strategy sins, uh, some things that we, we think about with respect to strategy that uh, maybe we ought not to think about? Uh, one is you know, failure to recognize or take seriously the fact that resources are really tight. And I was in a meeting with Secretary Hagel a couple of years ago when he was putting out the QDR, and he said, the military must be ready and capable to respond quickly to all contingencies and decisively defeat any opponent should deterrence fail. I don't know how you guys do that. <laughs> I mean, really, how? Quickly, to all decisively defeat anybody? You can decisively defeat China quickly? Or anybody? I mean, again, so uh, it's, it's great you know, a great thing to want to be able to do. Uh, but uh, again, resources just, just don't enable that. Uh, and as you can see here, it says, uh, Blitzkrieg, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you, know, you could have a great idea, you could have a great strategy, but if you don't have the resources to execute it, this is what Blitzkrieg looks like. You know, the Germans had the resources, to, you know, the tanks and the radios and the planes and all that. Uh, so I think the, you know, listen to the turtle, okay? Okay, uh, make, mistaking goals for strategy or choosing unrealistic goals. Um, this is part of the national security strategy in 2002. So we're going to prevent our enemies from threatening us, our allies, and our friends with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, if you're into deterrence, what do you think the Russians are doing with their nukes and the Chinese are doing with their nukes and the North Koreans? You know, these, that's what they're doing. Uh, they're, they're threatening us. You, know, you do certain things, you cross that line, and you know, this, is, this is where we're going. Uh, expanding the circle of development by opening societies and building the infrastructure of democracy. Uh, we're just going to go around and do that. Igniting a new era of global economic growth through free markets and free trade. Uh, again, the other guy's got to be willing, uh, especially if, if the other guy's not your enemy. So again, uh, these are goals, and they're certainly laudable goals, but, but they're not strategy. And I'm not sure how realistic they are. OK, and it's kind of reminded me of this. It says goals. There's, there's the tree. There's the lion. It says, if you can see it, you can reach it. Except for that tree, you'll never reach it. OK, so, so think about that. Uh, yeah, you you want to set ambitious goals, but they've got to be realistic. OK, failure to recognize the, sta the, the strategic problem or that it might change. And again, the pivot or the rebalance to the Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm all for it um, f for my own reasons. But what, what, are we, what is the purpose of the rebalance? Uh, in my mind, it's to defend the first island chain, because we have uh, security commitments to all three countries that comprise the main portion of the first island chain. But I haven't really seen it written or talked about or planned against. So, okay, um, what are we, again, what are we trying to do here? Uh, what is the problem that we're trying to, to address and accomplish? Other than sort of in a vague way, promoting peace and stability. Uh, QDR provides an accurate de depiction of our future national security requirements. Okay, Admiral Mullen, um, I think uh, you know, I have a great deal of admiration for Admiral Mullen. I, I think it was probably maybe something written for him, I don't know. Um, but uh, Eisenhower would say, again, it's, it's planning. It's not the plan, it's planning. 
it, it doesn't, you know, the QDR is a point in time. It's not the plan, it's planning. Uh, this is my favorite slide, okay? Failure to understand the enemy. Okay, here's Hermann Goering. Hermann in 39, Hermann in 40, Hermann in 42. The only thing the Americans are good at is making automobiles, but not planes. The Americans can't build planes. They're very good at refrigerators and razor blades. Okay, so we know we're good at automobiles, refrigerators, and razor blades. Uh, America is all talk and no action. This is 1942. I mean, but he stops saying that after 1942. So I guess <laughs> eventually Herman, Herman gets it, okay? Herman gets it in more ways than one. Uh, but, uh, and uh, again, you know, Herman's not the only one. President Johnson uh, gives a speech uh, at Johns Hopkins in April 65. This is before, just before the major commitment of ground forces to Vietnam. And he gives this speech and he offers up basically a, uh, a New Deal program to the Vietnamese. Uh, we're going to build a TVA, you know, in the Mekong Valley and, and you know, this is going to promote economic growth, you know, all laudable. Uh, but uh, and he, after, the, uh, after the speech, the president says to uh, Bill Moyers, who was his uh, PR guy at the time, old ho can't turn me down now. Uh, a profound misunderstanding of what was motivating uh, the North Vietnamese in this, in this war. Okay, making false presumptions about our competence or the link between our strategy and the goals, or mistaking means for strategy. Sorry about this. This, it, uh, this is Senator Weary from uh, Nebraska. This is during the Civil War between the Nationalist Chinese and the Communist Chinese. And Weary says uh, on the floor of the Senate, with God's help, we'll lift Shanghai up until it's just like Kansas City. Okay, I don't know why he didn't say Omaha because he was a senator from Nebraska. But anyway, uh, it's not clear to me that uh, competence and causal linkages. Uh, it, if we were to get Shanghai to look like Kansas City, I'm not sure that would have done much uh, for Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist Chinese. But uh, so again, um, our strategy, this is President Bush, in terms of mistaking means for strategy, as the Iraqis stand up, we will stand down. That might be the strategy for getting us out of Iraq. But it's not a strategy for winning the war. It's just changing means, one set of means for another. So you have these, these means. How are you going to apply them to achieve the ends that you seek? And then finally, uh, strategy is not a Ben-Hur production. Yeah, you know, we're fortunate to have people like Secretary Davidson where she is because she is a strategist. And John Collins, uh, who I think many of you know from his time at uh, CRS, says, I think he puts it extremely well. Strategy is a game anybody can play. It's kind of like chess. But it's not a game just anyone can play well. Only the most gifted participants have a chance to win a prize. And if you look at the great strategies that we have developed over time, they haven't been developed by a cast of thousands. You look at NSC 68, 162-2, the Solarium Project, uh, some of the others during the Cold War. Small group of people who really know how to do strategy well. And uh, with advances in the cognitive sciences, we're finding out just, uh, just how you know, people think differently and the kinds of intellectual traits that are required uh, to think like a strategist. In fact, the British have a, a, a high command and staff course that they uh, send their rising flag officers to, uh, not just uh, so they can learn how to use the right fork and all that stuff, because you got, you, believe me, you guys don't know how to do that. But, uh, what they, they, they try and find out uh, through a series of tests and so on is, well, who's the right general to put in charge of you know, getting this program through the acquisition process? And who's the, the right one to, you know, to lead uh, a core in the field? Uh, or who's the right one to, to do strategic planning? Uh, and that's a big part of, of the effort that they have underway, which I think is, is quite good. Okay, um, I mentioned to you we're going to do a little bit on strategy and resolving the ends means disconnect uh, because you can see oftentimes we're prone to set unrealistic objectives uh, with inadequate resources. And right now, as I mentioned also, and certainly Secretary Davidson did, uh, you know, the threat graph's going like this and the resource graph is going like that. So let's look at some ways. Uh, one, <laughs> of course, give the Defense Department more money, more resources. Uh, you may have a trouble seeing this cartoon. It's called The Biggest Loser. This is the US taxpayer standing on top of the Pentagon with this huge Pentagon budget. 
Uh, and uh, you could say that the, you know, the person who drew this cartoon was saying, you know, the, the burden uh, on the American taxpayer of the defense budget is ginormous, and we need to do something about it. Uh, so the trend is, is actually the opposite of, of what you might think. And uh, here's the military, another cartoon, the social safety net, okay? So these are the entitlements and so on. Uh, you know, I feel your pain, they're trying to cut my funding too. Hey, you gonna eat that? And uh, you know, so again, the impression is that you've got this huge defense budget. Well, during the Cold War, uh, we averaged over 6% of GDP going to defense. Uh, currently, we're down to 3.6%. According to the CBO study that came out in, in January, uh, current trajectory will have us down to 2.6%. Now, that's not to say that we should peg our defense spending to a certain percentage of GDP. I think that's, that's uh, somewhat ridiculous. But it does give you a sense of, A, you know, where the current trajectory is, and some sense of, you know, in general, how the American fee people feel about, you know, where, uh, where all the wasteful money is going. Um, and then this is, uh, this is, again, from the CBO. If you look at defense spending today, and then in 2020, and then in 2026, uh, along with mandatory spending and interest on the debt, you see that defense goes up 22%, which is less than the projected economic growth. So defense, that's how you get from 3.6 to 2.6. Mandatory spending, 80% increase, that's uh, Social Security, uh, Medicaid, you know, Medicare. Um, by the way, the CBO also projects that the trust funds uh, will go broke earlier than expected, uh, probably in the early 2030s as opposed to the mid to late 2030s. And then if you look at interest on the debt, we go from 223 to 830. So that's about a 300% increase just on paying the interest on the debt. So if you think there's a lot of room for increases in defense spending, certainly we can get back to 6% if, if, you know, that we're, if we're entering a new Cold War. But the figures would tend to say, you know, you're going to be doing that because you're going to be inflicting some serious pain somewhere else. And uh, the CBO study, I think the most uh, provocative uh, sentence in the report was something along the lines of, we are quickly reaching the point where we can no longer roll over our debt to the next generation. Uh, so, you know, old against young, rich against poor, cats and dogs, uh, uh, but it, it, is a, uh, it is a serious problem. Uh, a problem that we can resolve, uh, but a problem that gets harder and harder to resolve the further and further we go into the future without taking action. So, uh, yes, we can spend more on defense, uh, but the, the political barriers and social barriers to doing that are growing, and as you can see, they're growing uh, non-linearly. Uh, and there's uh, Paul Paul Ryan. Uh, this is sequestration, which deals with defense spending and discretionary spending. The, uh, essentially the, the parts of the budget that are growing the most slowly, whereas the parts that are growing the most rapidly, which are entitlements and interest on the debt, are not being addressed by sequestration. So again, uh, that's where you are. Uh, second, you can uh, be more efficient. I, I love this cartoon, uh, this giant poster with, you know, stop waste in the tiny middle. Uh, I was in a meeting with uh, Secretary Panetta, um, who was getting ready to leave uh, office. And he had worked at uh, OMB, and he had been in the Budget Committee up on Capitol Hill. And as you, probably at least some of you know, a lot of efficiency savings are baked into the budget. You know, and, and it's a good thing. We should always try and become more efficient. The problem is, I'll be glad to respond to a question during the Q&A, uh, we often don't get there. In a lot of ways, we often make a, a difficult situation worse. Uh, and so when somebody said, uh, well, at least we have, you know, we have this about quarter of a trillion dollars of efficiency savings, you know, that we're going to work in that'll give us some relief, uh, Panetta looked and said, uh, that's a bunch of bullshit. That was his word, not mine. Uh, but again, there, there are a lot of reasons why uh, we don't typically get anything like the efficiencies we're hoping to get, and that can distort your planning priorities. Uh, third, we can outsource to allies. And uh, this is the Spithead Review. Uh, this is the Royal Navy forming for review uh, on the occasion of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And I counted seven aircraft carriers here. Okay, so that was in uh, 1953. Uh, and then we had the Queen's uh, Diamond Jubilee in, uh, in 2012. And I was struck by the... 
And uh, this, uh, I, uh, I, I gave this, I showed this slide at one other presentation, and uh, to his great credit, uh, a British officer in the audience you know, said uh, there was a, a review uh, with the Royal Navy, and uh, he offered to send me the photographs, and I have not gotten them yet. Uh, but the, uh, well, the point here um, is, if you look at the trends, okay, you know, from during the, uh, before 9-11, we were up, you know, in the late 90s when you had Allied force and so on in the Balkans. We've gone up since then for obvious reasons. Uh, our three principal allies uh, in Europe, the three great powers, have gone down. Uh, and with the Brits uh, last year, to their credit, being the only one of the three above the NATO standard. Uh, these countries, if you look at the, the kinds of pressures that are on us, uh, the pressures on them are even greater. Uh, they have more generous social welfare systems than we do. As Secretary Davidson said, they're dealing with this challenge of, of immigration, uh, refugees coming into Europe, which is going to stress that system even further. And they're old. There are more people over 60 in Germany, Italy, Spain, and Greece than there are under the age of 15. You know, they are, and so where does that, you know, again, uh, there's an increasing demand uh, for social welfare payments, where the, whereas you have a diminishing number of people of working age that are, and of course that's one of the reasons why they're having fewer children as well. So it's, it's kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, so to say you need to greatly ramp up your military effort they can do it, but again, the social and political barriers there are enormous, uh, even more, uh, especially when the Americans have been carrying a lot of the freight since the end of the Cold War, you know, the, the old uh, free rider principle. And so is that a, something to be tackled, or is it a, a condition that we should accept? I think that's a, an important strategic question for the United States. Uh, we can increase or divest commitments. Uh, strategy involves risk. But at what point, when you keep accumulating risk, do you cease to deter your enemies or reassure your friends? Okay, so yes, we can take on more risk. But we had, we had a huge uh, cushion uh, following the end of the Cold War. Uh, General uh, Abizade, who led the last National Defense Panel, said we are taking on risk at an, an alarming rate. So that, that buffer we had is being, uh, is being eroded. Uh, not necessarily because of our negligence, but because of changing circumstances in the world. You know, it's, it's one thing to plan against uh, North Korea and Libya. It's another thing to plan against China and Russia. And then finally, you can use resources more efficiently. Uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, more effectively. Uh, this is a, another way of saying craft a better strategy. You know, th again, rethink your strategy. Do we have a good one at the current time? Uh, it's almost a moot point because we're going to have a new administration in a few months, and every new administration comes in and begins to develop its own strategy. That's probably the closest it'll come to having a clean sheet of paper to work with. Uh, if we don't have a good strategy, or as Secretary Davidson mentioned, if things are changing so fast that whether we're going to have a third Obama administration or not, you need to rethink your strategy, just as we did in the late 40s, early 50s, when the international situation was changing rather dramatically. Then there's the potential to really improve our effectiveness if we can craft a good one. And also, that has to do with our military effectiveness in terms of, again, how do we leverage uh, emerging technologies in the commercial sector? How do we develop new operational concepts? How do we do it faster than the other guy? And then. Uh, as she said, potential boost to effectiveness heightens even further if the current circumstances are ripe for a discontinuous shift. And it's not just a discontinuous shift, I think, in terms of military capability. Uh, the geopolitical structure in Europe is very different. Geopolitical structure in the Middle East and the Far East. Countries have attitudes today that are very different than they had three or four or five years ago. And so there's a potential opportunity there to boost uh, our uh, sort of portfolio, if you will, of alliances and partners. Uh, so in, in a way, it's a scary time to be a strategist, but in, a great, uh, in, in a, another way, it's a great time uh, to be a strategist. So closing thoughts, um, Eisenhower was right, Colin Gray and John Collins, very hard to do, uh, but very necessary in times like these, where you, know, you don't need much of a strategy if, if things are gonna stay the same. 
uh, you know, if you, you kind of know the situation, when you really need a good strategy, or when you need strategy most, I guess I should say, is when things are changing rapidly. Uh, if you want to be successful, you have to have talented strategists, policymakers who value strategy. You, know, you have to sell to somebody. And then individuals and organizations capable of executing that strategy. Uh, Eisenhower was famous for his planning board, but he also had, I think it was called the Operations Coordination Board. And that was a very bureaucratic way of saying, about six months after Eisenhower made a big decision, uh, the people on this board were tasked to go out and see how well it was being executed. And if it wasn't being executed, then Eisenhower would start executing. Okay, uh, note to self, end on a positive note. Remember, <laughs> where your enemy enjoys, uh, unless your enemy has a huge advantage in resources, you know, if the resources are roughly the same, your strategy only needs to be better than his, okay? So, you know, there, there are people, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard for everybody, not just hard for you, not just hard for me. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, at least some consolation. So that, that ends my pitch. Um, I know there may be some questions out there, uh, and uh, I'll do my best, but remember, I'm giving you a choice. You have the physics jokes uh, from, the, from the CNO's executive panel staff that they, they, they told me for sure that, uh, in fact, uh, these were jokes that he might use at some point in time, maybe. So anyway, let me wrap up there and uh, turn it over to Mike, and if there are any Okay. Or jokes. Sir, thanks for coming to speak to us today. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Jeff Palmer, U.S. Navy. Um, given your comments talking about uh, Eisenhower's discussion of the importance of getting a contingent of skilled officers together to think deeply about strategy and other Navy initiatives to develop strategic thinking, such as the War College's Advanced Naval Strategist Curriculum uh, that, that was put in place, I believe, two years ago, I was wondering if you could comment on the apparent mixed message uh, sent by the CNO in deciding to shut down the Strategic Studies Group uh, instead of maybe refocusing its charter or uh, allocating resources in order to make sure he's getting out of that group what he wants. Okay. Um, what I can say about that, uh, first of all, I, I wasn't uh, privy, uh, I wasn't part of the decision-making process. Uh, I am very familiar with the CNO Strategic Studies Group. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the group uh, was not supposed to develop strategy. The idea was the group existed so that you had these rising, uh, you know, people with high potential to reach flag rank, that they would be exposed to senior officers, be able to do some work on their own so they would uh, have a better idea of how to understand, uh, how, how strategy works, I guess, uh, you know, some of the principles of strategy and so on. Um, my understanding, and it's just an understanding, is that the CNO is looking uh, to develop um, a successor to that organization. Uh, I also um, uh, am aware of the fact uh, that uh, the, the Secretary of Defense at one point had a strategic studies group. After a few years, he decided, uh, apropos of the question this gentleman asked over here earlier, uh, to have a, um, a uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Corporate Fellows Program where uh, you have uh, similar officers uh, going out to Apple and Google and Amazon and Caterpillar and so on uh, as a way of, of getting them integrated into the, the culture of industries who are operating under very high, uh, very, a very fast moving environment, very high degree of uncertainty uh, and where the, the competition is moving very rapidly. Uh, all I can say is I, I think uh, the concept of a strategic studies group to me makes a lot of sense, not because you're going to get these folks to come up with a brilliant strategy, but be, uh, for two reasons. One is uh, if, if they have high potential for flag rank, uh, you need to expose them. And number two, I mentioned earlier the British uh, High Command and Staff course, which during the course of their process uh, identifies people who can actually think strategically or do it very well as opposed to people whose talents may lie elsewhere, so. Sir, thanks for being here. Major Paul Ashenko, U.S. Army. Let me first just say that if you need any interested Army officers to help you in your endeavor to sabotage Army football, 
I got to continue to class me. Sabotage Army football? Well, not to put a, we haven't won since our plebe year, so. Uh, at any rate, you talked uh, a lot about, um, even though you may have an effective strategy, at least from your perception, you have to execute it, and that often takes political will. I'm wondering if you can comment on an apparent policy strategy mix match in several places around the world and how potentially we can reconcile that. We see it in the South China Sea, apparently, in Crimea, uh, and other places, sir. Well, I, I, uh, <clears throat> what we see, I, I think, um, uh, goodness, uh, we're over time. Let me just say very quickly, as Secretary Davidson said, we are in a very different world now. Um, and you know, maybe we don't realize it because there's always that constant uh, dealing with uh, radical terrorist groups and so on. We have three revisionist powers operating in three parts of the world along the Eurasian periphery that going back for a, nearly a century, we've said we cannot let any one of those areas fall under hostile control because the economic and industrial and manpower potential there could pose a, a serious threat to our security. And there are countries in those regions that agree with us. And uh, so the, the question is, you know, how do we do that? Uh, how do we you know, preserve the independence of those countries along that long arc that runs from Western Europe all the way up to uh, the Japanese islands? Uh, so I, I think the question is, uh, I think that's been a clear objective and a clear policy for every administration going back at least to Truman. And the question is, in a, in a world where things are changing rather rapidly, uh, how do we begin to adapt our policy and our strategy uh, to make good on that? And final thing I'll say is, from a strategist's perspective, if you look at GDP, uh, China has 60 percent of the GDP of the U.S. by some measures. No other competitor to ours over the last century had more than 40 percent. So to me, Westpac is number one. Number two, Westpac is the area where we have the least strategic depth. The first island chain is right there. Uh, Europe, we've got, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, uh, it's not that we want to give up Eastern Europe, but we have a lot of strategic depth in Europe, a lot of strategic depth in the Middle East. And third, the Western Pacific is the only region, uh, you know, not the Middle East and not Europe, where our strategic allies and partners do not have an advantage in terms of overall economic and industrial might. So they alone, you know, if you just use those metrics, could counterbalance the threats in those regions. So again, I mean, to me, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's Westpac, Westpac, Westpac right now. Uh, it, it, I think that is the area that requires the greatest gr degree of attention uh, and the greatest degree of thought in terms of how we're going to maintain peace and stability in that part of the world. And you could argue that we're late to the game, although you could also argue that what, in 2011, uh, the president said by the end of the, the decade, we'd have 60 percent of our naval and air forces in that part of the world. So are we slow to move? Maybe. Um, we don't have as much in the way of resources as we, we thought. Uh, the Middle East is not as quiet as we hoped. Uh, and, uh, but again, um, I, I think uh, that's going to be a, an incredibly interesting strategic issue for at least the next couple of years until we figure out how we're going to deal with the problem. Thank you very much.